So this was the first animation ever. Look at this shot. It's just stunningly animated. Wow, look at all that detail work. You know, you can see some cheats here. Big thanks to Puget Systems for sponsoring today's episode. All right, guys, welcome back. Just kidding. This is the first of its kind. <laughs> it's Animators React, and we have Eric Koenig with us today. He's a master. He's been doing it since the 90s. What have you worked on that people would know? Well, I went to school at a great place called Cal Arts, and then I got right in the animation industry, worked with a guy named Chuck Jones, a very famous Warner Brothers animator. I worked on a movie called Cats Don't Dance, then went to Disney, DreamWorks, and then for the last 13 or 14 years, I've been on The Simpsons. Have you drawn yourself into The Simpsons as a character? I am in The Simpsons movie. Really? Yes. Oh, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Get to my stay. I'm trapped. If I leave, I'm alone. Oh, God. In, out, in, out. I never saw Venice. Thank you. We love anime. We love, you know, old Disney movies and everything. And there's just so much to get into. So let's jump right in. You want to ride it, Tetsuo? All right. Let's hit it. <laughs> Katsura Otomo, I'm going to ruin his name, I apologize. His drawings, you know, are just painfully good. It inspires The Matrix and Cyberpunk and, you know, and a thousand things. It's just stunningly animated. The classic Japanese animation, you'll see a close-up of their face and just their mouths are moving. But he brought in animating the characters on ones. <laughs> If you want it so bad, then steal one yourself. There's 24 drawings a second, which adds that smoothness. It's fully articulated when they talk. There's a cheat in animation when you're working with animals, you know. We don't know how a cartoon elephant actually moves, because there is no cartoon elephants. But when you're animating a human being, everybody knows how human beings move. And so that fall, that fall. lands and it bounces <laughs> yeah. and scrapes and it hurts. <laughs> you know, you feel the cloth scraping against the ground. He just clapped that in his freaking yeah. muscle meat. Right you know, there. let's talk about like slow motion. Okay. It's almost like a, a natural speed ramp. Anytime something complicated happens, it's almost like time slows down just for that one moment, even if it's all in within one shot. Which then you see them copying in Matrix. Zack Snyder comes to mind as well. Technically, there's packed in more drawings to slow the time down. Sure, it's been done, what had been done before in animation, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, he came up with that idea. <laughs> you know, you can see some cheats here. If you look at the motorcycle, the motorcycle is one drawing, or it's like two or three drawings, and it's just doing a cycle. So it's a loop. It's a loop. And when you're Fred Flintstone or Scooby-Doo, anytime they're running, they're using the exact same cycle. We're running, Scoob, but like we're not going anywhere. They're a little bit frowned upon because it's a little bit of a cheat. Also, the background is, you know, the background's a simplified, just line streaking by, and it, it loops Absolutely. as well. Which also, some of the master shots of those backgrounds are filled with so much detail that your eye doesn't really know where to go. But when you simplify it down to speed lines like this, it pushes everything away, and all that they're concerned about is the screen direction. Part of animation is distracting your eye. We're not looking at the motorcycle. I'm looking at that guy in the foreground who's moving in beautiful perspective. So how the heck are they getting that light bloom effect that's like overlaid on top of the motorcycle? Or is that like after the fact? Are they cutting through? Are they not the trails, holes? but the bloom, right? Yeah, the bloom. And the trail. Let's talk about both. So. Back in the day when it was filmed on the camera, the box where the drawings went on was also a light table. Those bloom effects are hand-drawn elements and then they're hand animating that trail. Then what they would do is they would paint it in reverse. So it would just be a black image with the hole exposed. They would shoot the light through the light table into the camera and it would overexpose a little bit and it would create that glow effect. That's so cool. So this was the first animation ever. Yeah, Windsor McKay, who was a newspaper comic artist, he is 
tracing the background on each of the drawings. The way animation works is it's on layers. You know, it's kind of like Photoshop where there's a foreground element, a middle ground, a background and all of that. And you draw them on separate layers because you want them moving at different times. So he wasn't able to do that. So with each one of these drawings, he's going in and painstakingly tracing background. Oh my goodness. How long do you think this would have taken him oh, to do? I, I'm sure we can find out, but I'm going to guess it's probably over a year to make this film. That's pretty insane to think about. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of other things that you can really see the birth of. There's some real fundamental principles of animation, which are weight and gravity and follow through. And he's hitting them. You know, the dinosaur has a feel of weight. When you get into animation, the first assignments that you get are a bouncing ball, a walk cycle, and picking up a heavy object. And it starts you on your fundamentals of how to animate a scene. So here we've got our ball. It's heading down. So that would be my second drawing. Now, in timing, the closer the drawings are to each other, the slower it moves, the farther they are apart, the faster it moves. So here our ball comes in, it's heading towards the ground, then it hits the ground and it squatches. Then it starts to bounce and stretch up. And if you watch animation, the, the whole character will stretch up and you get this feel. Then, you know, it's bouncing up. Then I reach the apex of the arc and then it starts to slow down and then speed up again and then bam, hit again. This is timing, physics, everything. There obviously aren't dinosaurs to study, so <laughs> yeah. he's making this up, but he's probably looked at footage of elephants. The other early person that's credited at the beginning of animation is a photographer named Edward Mulbridge, who created these still cameras and they would run animals in front of the still cameras and you'd get to see the motion of the horse or the person running. So whether you're doing VFX or whether you're animating something, reference, Mm. Always got to go back to that ref. <laughs> hey guys, we just crossed 4 million subscribers. What? <laughs> yes! That's awesome! Thanks to all of you for subscribing. So we're only 999,000 subscribers away from 5 million. Let's do it! Consider subscribing! <laughs> Early on in my career, I got the chance to work with Chuck Jones and Maurice Noble, who were two of the Warner Brothers director and art director. Chuck Jones took all of us young animators and he said, let's watch The General together. He talked about how when they were boarding the famous Warner Brothers shorts, What's Opera Doc and Duck Rabbit Duck, what you're trying to get to is where you can tell the story completely visual and then the dialogue just acts as boosting up the character. Another principle in animation is a thing called silhouette value. The idea is that you could take your animation, fill it in with black, and all of the storytelling detail will actually read as a silhouette. Yeah, you got like the silhouette of a dark cannon and the bright field behind it. Right. So if you watch him, he's playing off of the cannon. He's lighting it in a way where you can see exactly what's going on. You know, he's using the negative space behind there. You have no confusion about what's about to happen to him. The big thing with watching Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin is the visual storytelling. Animation is a visual medium. Something recent would be like the first 10 minutes of Up, which completely plays visually and, you know, makes you ball your brains out, you know? <laughs> so what happens in animation is kind of two schools of animation start to get born right at the beginning. One that observes and emulates real life, and that would be the Disney school, where he was studying animals and studying, you know, human beings, and he had his artist really getting in there and trying to figure this out. Then Max Fleischer, who kind of came from more of a surreal point of view, he was less interested in real life and kind of had the idea, well, we're working in animation, and in animation you can do anything. So it's like, there are no limits. Yeah, he's not walking like a real human being. He's kind of moving to the music. You know, his lips are kind of got this beautiful kind of lyrical <laughs> whistle going on. That bridge between reality-based animation and surreal carries out for the rest of the history of animation. And this is something that like always blows my mind like with any medium is like, when somebody makes something like this where it's really without any precursor, the look of these animals, the way their eyes are drawn, the goofy physics and noodle the arms, and now this is one of like the defining styles of animation that has stuck with us for a century. Oh, 
Maybe you know the answer to this, but why do the characters wear those white gloves? Well, there is an element to these caricatures that are minstrel show, where they're caricaturing black people. You can see the black face and the, the white gloves. There's a whole history with jazz, and these cartoons are very jazz influenced. Again, these are guys from New York. Jazz was very subversive music at the time. It was born originally from slave music, and then it was a way for repressed black people to create their own art. The subtext of the cartoon is, do you want to join the KKK? I know it sounds really intense, but it is. Do you want to be a member? Do you want to be a member? Oh, geez. And Bimbo is, no, no, I won't, I won't. It's a subversive way to fight against racism with an early medium. It's really interesting. Wow, and it's, huh, that's fascinating. Like all that historical context just gets lost when you're watching this as a kid and it's just like, it's cartoon animals. Right, yeah. If there's ever a time to like talk about that stuff and bring it up, it's kind of now, it, yeah. you know, it's fascinating to know the history of it and you know, what's influencing these designs that in a way I think a lot of people just take for granted. It's shameful, but it is. There wouldn't be modern animation without these influences to draw from, you know, you have to, you have to go through these things. And, yeah. I mean, entertainment and art's going to reflect the society and the times that it's created in, both the good and the bad. It's also dark. You know, I love children's book authors like Raoul Dahl or Dr. Seuss. There's a darkness to their stories. What they're doing is that they're scaring kids into remembering a lesson. Do you guys have any examples of bad animation? Because I'd personally love to see it. Leave a comment down below letting us know and we'll break it down on the show. It's been a long time since I've seen this film. I definitely remember the pink elephant scene. That's like a Dumbo. Dumbo, sorry, <laughs> never mind. See, it's been a long time. Yeah. Come on, let's go in and poke somebody in the nose. Why? Well, oh, just for the fun of it. Okay, Lampy. Wow, look at all that detail work. I remember for a long time when I was young, I couldn't figure out why the backgrounds were always painted so nicely, but the parts that would move would always be flat colored. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the backgrounds are painted in watercolor that Native American is painting, and then the arms are animated elements. The artistry at the Disney Studios at this point had become so masterful that they were really able to use the gravity to tell the story of a wooden boy in cartoon form. And if you watch the top of his hair, when he moves, the hair is following through and it gives you a context to these characters. They feel solid in that world, that they're, they're real and they have come to life. What's going on? I gotta imagine it's very hard to communicate that inertia through hand-drawn animation because not only are you looking backwards at the motion, but you're kind of also looking forwards to the motion and you're drawing almost like different things in different stages of motion. Absolutely. There is a lot of physics and math involved in animation. There's a science element to animation, which is exactly what you're talking about. It's thinking ahead to an action and a reaction is gonna happen. So is, is the gravity and the motion what you're checking when you're like flipping between your current drawing and the previous drawing? So back in the day when we'd work on paper, it was actually you were able to look at five drawings. When you start a scene, you're doing the key poses of the scenes and I'm gonna rough out those four drawings. Once I've got those four drawings working, then I'm gonna start figuring out the drawings that go in between those drawings and that's again your math. There's another term in animation, it's called an S-curve. All organic things flow in an organic way. The physical element of animation is artistically figuring out where to put those in-betweens to create that snap and that weight. That's great insight. That's so cool. Hey guys, it's me, Jake. I've traveled across the space-time continuum to arrive at a new couch in a new location. For those of you who don't know, Corridor Digital is a video content company that has been making videos for 10 years on the internet. How do we do that? with Puget Systems Computers. And that's why today's sponsor is very near and dear to our heart. They are a small team based out of Puget Sound, Washington. They build custom workhorses for professional creators or people who are looking to break into the professional game. This is not your average dude you're getting a Dell, okay? This is high-end, high-quality stuff we're talking. And the way that they ensure that process is not only by making sure that they have top parts for everything they put into a machine, but also the best thing about Puget and the thing that we love about them the most as creators, you call them up, you tell them what it is you do, and they will build one to spec at the cost that you need, kit it out with 
all the bells and whistles, all the bio settings, all the tweaking that's necessary to do that job. We have peace of mind in knowing that they have the best customer service, they know exactly our machines, and if any time something goes wrong with them, we've got them right there to help. But anyways, if you guys are serious about breaking into a professional creative career, or you're already in a professional creative career, consider Puget Systems. Just head on over to PugetSystems.com, that's P-U-G-E-T systems.com. Tell them Corridor Digital sent you, or just click the link in the description of this video. So huge thanks to them once again, and uh, back to the video. I'm gonna teleport now again. Thank you guys so much for watching. This was really fun breaking this down for the first time. Thank you, Eric, for coming out. We have a ton of things to break down that we didn't get to on this episode. And I know you guys have some really fun ideas as well. So please leave a comment down below letting us know what cool animation scenes we need to break down so we can get Eric back and do another one of these episodes. And if you guys like Eric and you want to follow his work, then you can go over to his YouTube channel and check him out. The link is down below.